The first book bans in American history came in 1637 and 1650. Why did they happen? And what do they have in common with the recent attempts to ban books? Book banning in America has its roots in the religious fanaticism of the Puritan colonies of New England. Driven by their persecution in England and the desire to ensure their security in America, the Puritans were highly suspicious of social, political, and religious variations. While the Puritans were more extreme in their drive to preserve their status quo, their motive to ban books was not unlike the motives of parents who wanted Catcher in the Rye banned in 1951 and again in the 1980s. The paranoia against anything outside the norm, combined with the authoritarian examples set by the English monarchy, led to a radical attitude in favor of strict government control of their environment. Puritan leaders were convinced that the extreme control of thoughts and actions of their fellow colonists was essential to their survival. The creation and existence of the theocratic state of Massachusetts Bay is in complete opposition to the First Amendment principle of free expression. Yet many of our textbooks teach us that the Puritans were the model for freedom of religion. In reality, the Puritans believed that it was their duty to not allow religion, but instead to enforce religion in their society. True, they fought to escape religious persecution, but they were far from religiously tolerant. Had the First Amendment existed in their time, they would have been in violation of all five of the First Amendment freedoms, press and speech, petition and assembly, and religion. This is evident in the expulsion of reform-minded leaders such as Roger Williams and Anne Hutchinson. Williams was banished from Massachusetts for promoting the ideas of separation of church and state in what he called the liberty of conscience. Upon his banishment, Williams not only founded the colony of Rhode Island, but also the First Baptist Church of Providence, the oldest Baptist church in America. Like Williams, Ann Hutchinson had the audacity to disagree with Boston ministers on religious matters. Her outspokenness became known as the antinomian controversy. And it was a double whammy because she was a woman who dared to challenge her male superiors. The ministers taught their flocks that the way to get to heaven was through their works or deeds, when done in a pious and industrious manner. On the other hand, Anne claimed that it was the grace of God that led people to heaven, and that it was not based on how hard you worked. This disagreement and Anne's unwillingness to behave led to her arrest. She was put on trial for slandering the ministry, and after her conviction was banished from Massachusetts, in much the same way that Roger Williams had been cast out a few years earlier. It was during the antinomian controversy that the first book ban in America occurred, just as the paranoia of Puritan leaders was at a feverish high. In 1637, just prior to Anne Hutchinson's trial, another English colonist by the name of Thomas Morton, a longtime critic of Puritan theocratic rule in New England, published a three-volume pamphlet entitled The New English Canaan. In his writing, Morton's worst offense was to claim that the natives were actually more civilized than the Puritans. The mere suggestion that a godless native was civilized amounted to nothing less than treason in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Morton was a free spirit who valued art and poetry over the strictly utilitarian and ultra-Calvinist Puritans. The lack of conformity to Puritan society is what made his writing the target for the first book ban in American history. The Puritan and Pilgrim leaders sought to silence Morton and to destroy his pamphlets. Miles Standish, the renowned military leader who came to America with the Pilgrims, was sent to present-day Quincy, Massachusetts to arrest Morton. After his capture, Morton was exiled to the Isle of Shoals until his banishment back to England. 
Precipitated by the events of the English Civil War back at home, Morton returned to the Massachusetts Bay Colony, where he was promptly arrested again. This time, accused of being a royalist agitator, he was tried for sedition and imprisoned. Like Thomas Morton, William Pynchon became critical of the Puritan theocracy in Massachusetts. However, unlike Morton, Pynchon was himself a devout Puritan. His criticisms of Puritan society were more about the harsh realities of life in the frontier of Western Massachusetts. It is safe to assume that Pynchon, who was best known for being the founding father of Springfield, Massachusetts, was motivated by a desire to protect his new settlement on the frontier. While this attitude has a lot in common with the overall Puritan mindset, his reality led to a different conclusion. He became a supporter of individual religious freedom, embracing new ideas such as those promoted by Anne Hutchinson. Likewise, Pynchon shared the views of Thomas Morton regarding Native Americans. Both of these viewpoints would lead to better security in Springfield. He gained strength in numbers by attracting settlers from all religious walks of life, and he prevented Native attacks by promoting mutual respect and support. In a burst of conscience, Pynchon decided to put his views out there, and in 1650 he penned the meritorious price of our redemption. In this pamphlet, Pynchon outlined his opposition to the Calvinist view of predestination, which was a core religious belief held by the Puritans. Predestination means that only a select group of people who are predetermined by God would go to heaven. Pynchon's scandalous claim was that anyone who was obedient to God and who lived by Christian teachings would go to heaven. An idea that was much more palatable than the thought of being damned to hell at birth. However, when the Puritan elders read Pynchon's prose, they lost their collective marbles. The pamphlet was burned in Boston Common and William was accused of heresy, a crime that was punishable by death at that time. To put this into historical context, the first person to be executed for being a witch in Massachusetts was Margaret Jones, just two years earlier. One of the jurors during that trial was none other than William Pynchon. The relationship that Pynchon's pamphlet has with this history is interesting, since a 1647 book entitled The Discovery of Witches was regarded as a valuable legal text. But Pynchon's book was heresy. Pynchon was able to avoid punishment for his crime by returning to England in 1652, where he remained until his death. The Discovery of Witches was written by Matthew Hopkins. Hopkins was born in Wenham, England about 1620, and his father was a popular Puritan minister there. Around 1640, Hopkins and his associate John Stern began hunting witches in the area around Essex, England. In their first set of indictments, 23 women were tried for witchcraft, four of whom died in prison, while the other 19 were hanged. While hunting witches was not a new concept in 1640, the nature of their trials had changed. During the reign of Charles I, witches were not accused of crimes, but instead were condemned for making a pact with the devil. This made witchcraft heresy, a death sentence during Puritan rule. Hopkins was paid the equivalent of $5,000 by each town who hired him to hunt down witches in their midst, and during these hunts, he wrote The Discovery of Witches. The book drew a lot from the writings of King James I, such as in the Daemonology, which tried to explain the occult and black magic. Hopkins outlined the methods he used to identify witches, such as tying them in a chair and throwing them in the water. If they floated, they were witches. He would sometimes cut off the arm of the suspect and would determine by the amount it bled if they were a witch. He also relied a lot upon what was known as the devil's mark. It was usually a mole or birthmark, a freckle or a scar. He used the process called pricking to stab the mark because the true devil's mark wouldn't bleed. 
He sometimes would stick people with needles in search of hidden devil's marks. In the colonies, the discovery of witches held a status that would be considered equal to Supreme Court case law in the United States today. It was the law of the land for about 50 years in New England, and it was directly cited in the conviction and execution of Alice Young and the aforementioned Margaret Jones. His witch hunting methods were used to torture and kill over 80 people in the American colonies from 1648 to 1663, and again during the Salem Witch Trials in 1692. From the beginning, book bans in America didn't really pass the straight face test. Book bans have little to do with common sense. But what is clear is that the people will ban books as a way to maintain their concept of an ideal society. Those in power are eager to protect the status quo and to quell the fear of change. <laughs> 